Mysticism Insights is an effort from members and supporters of the VenusProject.com resource-based economy and is not an official spokesperson, representative, or act in any official capacity and serves only to encourage, support, and motivate other TVP activists. Project Research Center uh, in Venus, Florida, and I have a very, very special guest today that I, I, I know that you'll just absolutely love uh, getting to know and learning about. Uh, this is Carl Geisler, uh, who is uh, a wonderful friend that I've made and Absolutely. had the opportunity to spend time with while I was volunteering here at the Research Center, and he comes here and sees Jack, and uh, I, I, I just... We'll give you some background on uh, Carl. Uh, Carl began here in Florida uh, when Jock was first uh, introducing his lectures, and he, he, he came in in the early uh, 71? Yes. In 1971. So uh, he's going to provide some insight, and I just would like to welcome you and uh, to the uh, Activism Insights show. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the wonderful experiences that you've shared and, and experienced. And what would you like to know? Well, first off, how you learned of Jacques. How did you learn of these uh, of Jacques and his lectures and, and a little bit about attending those lectures, what it was like? Oh, okay. I, uh, I lived in Miami. I came to Miami uh, in 19... 70 for the second time, yeah. she said to me, you know, Carl, I know somebody in Miami that you would love to meet. And he, she said, well, when do you have time? Ah, she knocked on the door and Jacques came out and um, he wore a captain's hat that <coughs> he used to wear during that time. Yeah. And she introduced me to Jacques and Jacques invited us inside. And, uh, we started talking and basically he asked me like questions. Um, these were normal questions that Jacques used like in an introductory lecture during that time. He would ask questions like, um, are you religious? Do you believe in God? Uh, mm. where, do you polit where do you politically stand? Left, right, center, you know? Mm. Uh, what books do you have you read that were significant to you? What people do you admire? And questions, you know, like that, mm -hmm. to get to know me better, to get, sure. have some idea of what my background was and my thinking was. Uh -huh. And so and then he kept talking and uh, he explained to me that uh, he gave lectures in his house and that if I'm more interested in learning about his point of view that uh, I should come. And I told him I, I, would, you know, I would definitely come. And How often were those lectures? Did he say we have them so and so? Or? Yeah, yeah. During that time they were four times a week. Wow. Uh, they were thir you know, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays every weekend. And, uh, there was a constant influx of people, you know, I noticed once I went there several times I saw that I saw very familiar faces, but there also were constantly like one or two people coming per night, mm -hmm. came in and they heard from Chuck in various ways. Uh, but the most significant thing uh, during that meeting was he, he invited me, he, he, he took me to his library and he gave me a book. Wow. It was called The Waste Makers by Vince Packard. And Vince Packard was a sociologist during the 1960s. He became really popular. He wrote a book like The Pyramid Climbers, mm -hmm. um, which dealt with the corporate structure and the competition to the top and mm -hmm. what that entailed and uh, so on. But he gave me a book by Vince Packard called The Waste Makers which basically showed that the whole our economic system was based on waste and building obsolescence uh, and showed you how people's taste and desires were manipulated mm -hmm. 
so that they would buy a lot of products, many of them, many of them that were useless uh -huh. and were, you know, not functional design. They were designed to break down and wear out. They had unnecessary features. They were updated every year so yeah. that you had to buy new ones. Mm -hmm. and so they made, you know, superficial style changes and so on. That obsolescence. Yeah, yeah. And that book had a tremendous impact on me because it showed me that the whole economic system to a certain extent was based on manipulation mm -hmm. and maintaining high consumption and waste. And so I started, you know, that made me question uh, the whole social system that I lived in. The first book that he gave you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Did he yeah. charge you for that book? Did he say No, hey, okay. no, 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 no. Uh -huh. I read it and I returned it to him. And uh, what I Jack did, which was incredibly helpful, once you, you know, he generally gave you, once you came to one of his lectures and you showed interest, um, he gave you a book list. Wow. Okay. And with a whole variety of books. Fantastic. You know, like uh, Beer Skinner, uh, you know, Beer Skinner, uh, Behaviorism. Uh, he put heavy emphasis on language. John mm -hmm. put always heavy emphasis that on day. language. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the Tyranny of Words. By All him, right. Uh, sure. Uh, People in Quantity is mm -hmm. another book that... Which many he, he, these titles he does to this day. Yes, uh, yes. The importance has yes, changed yes. all. Kosipski, Science of Sanity, was another very important book. <laughs> and because Jacques, even in his lectures, he switched during his lectures a lot of times, he would say, well, let me express this in a new language. Wow. And he gave you a much more functional definition of how he saw things were. Mm. rather than giving you some, you know, great philosophical description of something. Mm -hmm. And did he use, it's, it, we had talked earlier, and he utilized a blackboard in his home. Yes. These, these are all done in his home. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, they were done in his home, and he had, he didn't have a blackboard, it was like a whiteboard. Okay. And then he wrote with a black pen on it. And also, of course, when he gave lectures, what was so fascinating about Chuck giving lectures is, that he illustrated them as well. Wow. So you got a visual reference for it as well. Like Chuck was, um, you know, during my lifetime now, in retrospect, I can not honestly say, that he, he was just an incredible lecturer, you know. I mean, apart from that he was, you know, that, that he was really interesting, that he made things really come alive for you. Mm -hmm. It was not like, you know, if you go to a lecture by certain professors that they're incredibly dry and, you know, <laughs> it's easily to get bored sometimes totally. because they are so abstract sometimes. Yes. But Jack was just the opposite. He, and what he did sometimes is that he would start on, let's say, a problem and then would go circular and go from one problem to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And he would go into different regions of science. He would combine, let's say, psychology, problems in psychology, with problems in the scientific method, and with some uh, sociological description, wow. and so on. So he would try to sort of combine different aspects. Wow. And the lectures became really, really interesting. Uh, like there was a core group of people that came, you know, re really uh, relatively regular. Mm -hmm. Once, um, another thing I, that was interesting about it was that he then, when the core group was together, he would then ask us, well, what do you want to talk to tonight? Ah. And so then people could, you know, say, well, I want to talk about uh, problems in human relations. How can men and women get better along with each other? Sure. Wow. Uh, uh, how would you raise children in a more intelligent way? How would you educate children? Uh, you know, so there would then the city questions would be asked by you know by the members, and then he would then go into much more detail. So it might take all kinds of directions. Oh yeah, yeah. You would never know where Chuck was going, <laughs> and you would never know where he was ending up. Gosh. Because it was very spontaneous. Uh -huh. Spontaneous. Yes. He didn't. Wow. You know, he didn't have to have notes. Chuck had never notes that he <laughs> looked at when he lectured. You know, he just. He used his own knowledge and his own experience and his own insights and, you know, and 
or sometimes we would talk about you know the redesign of society. What in how would one redesign institutions? What type of human values would be necessary for people to get along in a more peaceful way, rather than with war and disagreements and with jails and judges and the whole structure that we have today mm -hmm. and we take for you know for normal. Yes. The things that we take for normal today are not really that normal. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, you know, so, like he talked, for instance, one thing that really uh, uh, I found very interesting when he talked about quote unquote uh, higher sanity of human relationships. He talked about the relationship between men and women. And he said, well, you know, it's not natural for men to look at tits and ass and saying, you know, well, Look how beautiful she is. You get know. a lot of yeah. Get a lot of that ass. You know, look at her tits. You know, he said, well, you know, when I was in the South Sea Islands uh, as a young man, uh, no native looked at tits and ass. They looked at a woman's eyes when they talked. Sure. So, yeah. No magazines. Yeah, yeah. They were, yeah, they were all no, learned. Yeah, yeah. It was just natural. People walked around naked. And they didn't look at somebody's cock or ass or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a natural thing. The children were naked, so when, it was a completely natural thing. So right. they, they had no, they had no sexual uh, fantasies yeah. or aberrations at all. And, uh, so the behavior that we experience in yes, yes, society yes, learned yes, and yes, yes. Uh -huh, and so and emanated and yeah, and yeah. replicated. Yeah. And he would say at night when the fishermen came in, they were went out, let's say during the daytime when they came in, they shared their fish with everybody, with mm -hmm. the children that were, were by the ocean and so on, and nobody placed any emphasis, well, he's going to get more than me, you know, and how much are, are you going to charge for each one of them? You know, none of this. And so it became clear to me, especially when he talked about, like, comparative values between people, and, uh, and that what we consider sane was very unsane. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes. the fact that, that our society, that some people have so much mm. and other people have absolutely nothing. Yeah. They didn't even have enough to eat of it. Mm. You know, so they, had, they had lousy schools to go to with children yes. who were you know, poorly educated. He mm. pointed out all these things. And so that had a tremendous impact on me, how I started to look at people and how I started to look at our institutions. Mm -hmm. And he would say to you, he would say openly, he said, look, if you talk about, you know, this point of view to people, you might lose them. You mm -hmm. might lose your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would tell you, mm -hmm. you know, if you adopt my point of view, <laughs> you know, a more you, you're going to run into problems in yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what he would say. Sure, you sure. Know. So this group of people must yeah. have been diverse. There were, you know, they didn't all come from a certain background. They weren't all philosophical. You had a different mix of people, oh, men and women. Oh, yes, very uh -huh. much so. We, students came from the University of Miami, from different places. There were different age groups, you know, people, some of them were middle-aged. Some of them were my age, but and then also you had constant, like I said, you had, you know, new, new people come in constantly that came into a lecture. And Jack, you know, another thing that I found really absolutely amazing about Jack was that he was incredibly courteous to people. Mm. Every new person, if there were 15 people in the lecture and 13 of them belonged to the core group, he ignored the core group and had and asked that new person specific questions and then geared an introductory lecture to them wow. for a whole hour. Wow. To help get them up to Exactly. Uh -huh. To explain to them and try you know, he tried to relate to them as best as he could, which was not always easy because, you know, people came and they had, of course, very divergent points of view, you know. Mm, that so, must have been. You know, some of people came, they weren't going to be uh, religious, some of them came, they weren't going to be conservative, so, uh, but he showed courtesy to every single one. Yeah, each yeah. new one. Yeah. There's another thing that I wanted to, to go over 
we're getting close on time. Yeah. But that it was so important to you to continue this education, to continue this this uh, learning experience and this connection with Jacques that you were actually offered a position uh, to to leave the Miami area or Florida to go to uh, New York for tens of thousands of dollars. Well, it more, wasn't tens of thousands of dollars. But twenty thousand but more. But was uh, of lot of, They offered me a huge, huge raise. You know, I have worked as an onboard service director for Amtrak during that time, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so mm -hmm. once. I knew everything, so I learned basically everything that happens on a train in mm -hmm. terms of service so on. And so I would work on trains that used to run between Miami and New York and between Miami and Chicago. And so what, so I worked, I did this job for three years. And so in my third year, then they said, well, look, if you want to move up into management, uh, you need to then take the next step and we have the best management opportunities we need mm -hmm. you either in, in Chicago or New York. So they said we're gonna move you to New York and we give you gonna give you a huge increase in, in salary and you go to the next level in the management positions, you know. So it was basically you when you're working for a large corporation like Amtrak, you know, so they give you a really good foundation and then try to move you up. At each, you go through different stages. You know, mm -hmm. you sure. climb the corporate ladder, especially right? back then. Yeah, yeah, you climb the corporate ladder, and you turned them down. No, yeah, I said, look, <laughs> I don't. You know, I, I, I said to my immediate supervisor, I said to him, look, I don't want to go. You know, because yeah. first of all, I was involved with job, which was very, very important to me because wow. I realized that I can learn things from Jack and that he would give me. Uh, a foundation of knowledge that I had no idea would I find anywhere else. And I was attached to the people that came there because mm -hmm. it was one of the greatest experiences in my life. Gosh, because wow. when you are surrounded, first of all, if you are surrounded in a whole group, let's say you have 15 people in a group, each one of them learns, reads, studies, shares ideas. and that is one of the greatest experiences yeah. that you can have because right. you, it's like a small intellectual community. And then also being around Jacques and having the opportunity to go with him to the beach or to go to a movie or to do things with him and being around him, or even just going to the junkyard and looking, <laughs> looking for medals, you know, yeah. it, it was so interesting yeah. because yeah. Jacques, to me, was during that time the most interesting person that I have ever met in my life. And he had an incredible energy level. He was funny, he was outspoken, he was irrelevant, he was incredibly charismatic, you know. And in the same time he was kind, you know, that kindness. You could see that here was a man who basically dedicated his whole life mm to make the world a better place. Yes, yes. And he was not rich. He he didn't charge anything for his lectures. Right, that's it, yeah. You know, he didn't anybody going to, he didn't even ask, you know. He, once in a while he would say, what, uh, you can pay a dollar if you can afford it. Right? Yes, yes. And, and if you can't, come yeah, in anyway. Way. Yeah, come in anyway. If you're interested in my ideas, come in anyway. Well, I think it was so, so very fortunate yeah. to experience those days, ah. and, and I can't thank you enough for yeah. taking the time yeah. to share. I'd like to do some more interviews that we can do longer and then break them up yeah. so that others can learn more about what yeah. that was like, and, yeah. and I just want to thank you, Carl, as I know so many of us will, uh, right. that you participated and helped in what we have yeah. today, yeah. and just very, very thankful for taking the time sure. to share with us sure. what those days from 71 on were like. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Well, thank to you. Hear thank that. you very really much. I should love you. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> so we've got to make it short. Okay. Uh, we thank everybody for watching. Uh, Carl has an email. If he'll provide it, we'll provide that. If you'd like to know more, we're going to try to shoot some more video while he's here. We're here at the Research Center in February. Uh, 2017. It's 17. <laughs> <laughs> 2017. So
So thanks, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you in a little bit. Bye. For more information on the VenusProject.com resource-based economy, log on to the VenusProject.com website or check out the VenusProject.com YouTube channels and Facebook pages.